Boundless, a game by Wonderstruck Studios that was originally going to be known as Ord Online, but had a name change after getting backed by Sony, similar to how No Man's Sky did. Unfortunately for me, I have never touched nor stayed in touch with this game until just a few weeks ago, and I got freaking hooked. In the short term, this game is great. There are a few issues, but the potential of this game is capable of rivaling the likes of Minecraft. But why do I think so? Well, let's start off with how the game presents itself. Graphically speaking, it is a much prettier form of Minecraft, like one of those HD texture packs. Another unique feature is the voxels can be sculpted into different shapes when you're out exploring in the world, giving some non-blocky appearances to the atmosphere. There are dozens of planets in the game, which all have their own unique color palettes, themes, and designs. Similar, again, to No Man's Sky. However, the planets all have a unique theme and individual biomes. You're not going to be seeing a singular biome the whole planet like you would in No Man's Sky, and honestly, that adds a bit of new experience to adventuring and just wandering around it. Of course, the characters in the game have a bit of a weird style to see. This is called the Oort Race. The Oort Race is quite colorful compared to normal people, but it is a bit odd to just see them in a loincloth all the time. There are no NPCs, so Oorts are just going to be players that you'll see out in the world, except for Mr. Tutorial here in the Sanctum. But I kind of enjoy this bright, colorful, glossy kind of style. Monsters also have this style, and it kind of fits with how bright and vibrantly colored the planets you'll visit are. Other than the starting sanctum, there are no developer-made structures anywhere in the game. But that's just the visual surface of the game. The audio work is quite good as well. There's ambience on the plants, which already punts Minecraft out of the park. There's birds chirping, creeks of ice if you're in a tundra, winds blowing when you're really high up, trickles when you're in a cave. Just that little bit of sound really adds a lot more detail to the world and actually makes it feel like you're in a world. Then the soundtrack is nice as well. It has some nice chill ambience music, which suits the atmosphere of when you're roaming a new planet or just building up your home. The soundtrack can be a bit odd at times, as there's a few tracks that just sound a bit depressing and out of place compared to the others. Other than that little consistency, it's still a pleasant overall sound design. Save for the, uh, womps when you transition between settlements too quickly. That and the Oort language caught me off guard a bit when somebody slash waved to me for the first time. It's just quite ambience, then... Hiya! But that aside, let's look at the gameplay. The game is pretty much a Minecraft MMO, so there's a lot of content for me to dig through. But let's start where we will all start. The Sanctum. The Sanctum is where you're taught to shove a gem into a totem. Then you aim it at a planet, pick your destination on these portal blocks, break them, and then bam, you're off at your starting zone. This is what I'll call the hard way of moving between planets. There are these portals which I'll go into detail later, but the tutorial teaches you how to smack trees, rocks, and craft them into stuff. You eventually make a campfire that will claim territory as your own for two hours. After a bit more smacking of rocks and trees, you'll make a beacon with fuel to make this plot your territory for a whole month. I should also bring up how plots work. Plots are an 8x8x8 chunk of the map that is officially yours. It's protected from other players messing with it, and it also protects your stuff from world regeneration. The way Boundless works is that the world around you will repair itself over time when players have been absent for a while. This stops the plants from looking like a certain Minecraft server, and also makes valuable resources like ores regenerate naturally over time. Some players take advantage of this, making mines and farms to get needed resources at a hotspot for said materials. The game also has a skill system. You earn experience from practically doing anything in the game, like crafting, mining, hunting, etc. As your character levels up, you'll get a crate to open up that'll contain skill points and cubits. Cubits are the premium currency of the game and can be bought with real life money. They can be used to buy more plots to expand your home base. Also cosmetics and game-based services. Services like having another character slot or skill resets. They give it at a fairly generous rate, so there's not much reason to invest heavily in microtransactions. But going back to the skill system, there's attributes, which will increase what you can do in the game. There are such attributes that will make you hit things harder and faster, have more health and stamina, and basically just make your character better. There's also these big perks called epics, which are a bit costly but very powerful. 
They can do things like increase your jump high, unlock high-end crafting skills, or give you a useful light aura for mining. You're also free to experiment with what you want before level 20, as respects are free prior to that. Personally, I took some of the cubits that they gave you and made an alt character so you can have like a dedicated miner, crafter, or hunter. These are what I'll call the key professions of the game that I'll go into detail with, starting with the miner slash gatherer. In this craft-heavy game, resource gatherers are going to be your bread and butter to get things going. A good miner in this game is focused on hitting blocks out in the world as fast and hard as possible. Basically getting to the point where you can one-shot blocks. But as you use your tools, you also use your stamina up. And now's a good time to bring up how the stamina system works. The stamina in this game works similarly to Minecraft. You have an energy bar that depletes over time as you do stuff. It replenishes when you don't do anything for a few seconds. But the maximum amount of energy you have will slowly lower as you run around and use your energy up. This means you gotta eat to replenish that bar. When your character is full, you'll start to replenish health again and also have maximum energy to go out and do stuff again. So consider starting to farm whenever you get the chance. Another key element of this game is crafting, which is what you think it is. You get raw resources and refine them up into components, then build them into higher tier tools or gear. Like I said, I have a dedicated crafting alt that I use to make fancy stuff with. Especially after spending time with a crafting table, you begin to make machines. Machines are pretty much just specialized crafting tables for either refinement or making really expensive stuff. You also need a power source to get your machines going, and have to link them up similar to power cables in Minecraft Tekka. Machines also suffer wear and tear as you use them up, and you'll need a special spanner to fix them. There's also the Center Forge, which is like Minecraft enchanting, but it does more than give an item an increased durability or damage. It can also give items an area of effect, making mining vastly easier. Or give the bombs a special buff to buff nearby allies or yourself with when it detonates. So don't freak out if somebody rolls a bomb at you in-game. It's probably just their way of healing you. Centraforging is incredibly resource-heavy, and it's very much an in-game thing. I find it's usually easier just to outright buy forged items if you can find a good player-owned shop selling them but crafting is mostly a waiting game. That's why I settle them into being an alt, so you can have them just refine resources for your miner or hunter and move on. Speaking of hunters, hunting! Hunting is the player versus environment system of the game. There are creatures present throughout. Each of them have their own unique drops and resources to gather as well. They won't attack you on a tier 1 planet unless you attack first, so I usually recommend that you start there so you can figure the game out in peace. But anyway, the monster lineup is small, but unique. They have wild stocks. These creatures are always passive until attacked. They'll charge you fast and hard, and are prone to knock you off a cliff. Then we have roadrunners. These creatures are very fast and live up to their name. They flee at your presence, and it took uh, having a max speed character to even have a decent chance at catching up with them. The game has a bit of a stealth mechanic to sneak up on them too, but it's not the most fleshed out, nor am I the most stealthiest of characters. It's pretty much just use a slow button and hope the enemies don't see you. The next critter is the spitter, and it does what it's called. It spits stuff. Typically projectiles. Lower ones just typically fire a singular projectile, but higher tier ones will spit volleys and even bombs at you that you'll have to dodge. We also have this game's version of the Minecraft creeper, the hopper. If you hear a grumble and a teapot hissing, that means something is about to explode and most likely will kill you. These guys bounce around and are extremely deadly. The bouncing makes them surprisingly evasive when you think about it, but land a lucky shot and you can knock them over and they'll start rolling around like a pinball, which is kind of a nice feature. They're usually vulnerable when they're in this rolling state, and you don't have much time to move before they recover, so try to strike when you can. Finally, we have the Cuddle Trunk. It's a flying squid that shoots projectiles at you, and also moves very evasively as well. Typically, I think these guys are the biggest threat, since they have a rather unfair projectile that has a homing track on you, and I can never outrun it. That's it for enemies. The variation is a bit limited, but the higher tier ones have new abilities and even elements which can inflict status effects on your character. This makes combat rather challenging, and quite a fun time that you'll need to be prepared for. There are also these meteorite events which spawn waves of monsters. 
After you defeat a few waves or die, you can break open the meteor. Based on if you survived or not, you can get a consolation prize or rare materials. Higher tier meteorites on higher tier plants give greater rewards. Difficulty and rewards also increase if you bring a friend along as well, making for a big chunk of rare materials to bring home. It's also split between multiple characters, so no arguing on who gets that box inside of the meteor. Speaking of friends, that brings me to the next point, player interaction. This is an MMO game, so this is going to be a big important part. I should probably mention that there is no player versus player in this game. Save for a few community-made games that people have made. Players, as I said earlier, are also responsible for building everything in the game. They even have an economy system where everything can be bought and sold by players. And that's a big feature, because there's different professions and types of specialist crafters that players can be. Players have even created amazingly expansive malls where people are free to set up a shop if they ask. You can also find just about anything there. Players can also link their buildings together to make settlements. Then there are also portal hubs that link planets and people together. Portal hubs are pretty much how players get around to different worlds with ease. Portals are these neat little box holes that can take you from one world to another in just a few steps. Give it a quick load time. They take a rare resource that you can only get from hunting to maintain, but even just doing an hour or so worth of hunting will get you enough to last a personal portal for a few weeks. Of course, playing with people is optional, but I highly recommend. The community is very nice too, and I think you might enjoy it. But let's talk about some of the other systems in game, like farming. As I mentioned, food is necessary, and there's some simple foods that you can grow to start off. But when you get beyond your simple foods, things get a bit more complicated. Crops have a favorite block that they like to be planted on, so you have to do a bit of soil work for that. Otherwise, you'll just hurt the yield of your crop. There are two types of yields in this game. There's seed yield and crop yield. Seed yield will yield a seed, so you can replant it later. Crop yield will just give you more crop. You want to strike a balance for this, but I also find a bit of difficulty striking that balance. There are also some specialty blocks that can be used to increase or sacrifice one or the other. Personally, I just aim to go for as renewable as possible. I think the seed yield is way too low even if I use the specialist blocks for it, as it seems to cap out at 130%. Meaning after waiting a few hours for a crop to grow, and yes, that's real life hours by the way, you're guaranteed only a one third chance of a seed. That plus the ideal crop setups aren't quite easy to figure out. You gotta play a bit of Tetris to hit the preferred blocks and figure out optimal yields for them. And even so, it might be a bit weird why one doesn't get 100% seed yield because something's not 100% perfect. There also isn't very many skills to enhance farming either. It's just a slight yield drop rate epic and the ability to plant different crops and that's it. It can be fleshed out better, but hey, free materials I guess. We also have the building system. I'm surprised I haven't talked about this already. But building does actually have skills for it. There's control, which increases your interaction range, which also includes how far away you can place a block, making building much easier. There's also skills for using these chisel tools, so you can sculpt blocks to simple shapes to perfectly fine-tune your builds. This breaks up the monotony of seeing those big old blocks, and honestly, it makes people's builds a lot more interesting. There's also a score for your builds called a prestige system in-game. Each block has a value based on how complicated it was to make. So, more difficult to make blocks means it's worth a lot more prestige. But why get prestige? Well, after a certain level of gaining prestige for your plot, you can become a settlement. A settlement is a group of people's plots nearby, so think like a town. You also earn footfall, or a special coin bonus when people enter your settlement. And if you get the highest score of all builds on that planet, you become the capital. It's not a majorly involved system, but it's still nice to see. And finally, we have the end game. It's a bit lackluster right now, but there are these things called exoplanets. These are planets that appear in orbits of high tier planets for a limited time, and they can be even higher tier planets than anything available, and offer some serious rewards. They can have an abundance of metals, gems, but also exclusive exo ores. These planets don't seem to regenerate, so it's a bit of a gold rush when they come. You can also do hunting and meteors there for extremely rare rewards as well. Albeit, you're definitely going to want to group for this. And that sums up the major things in Boundless. It's quite a content-packed game, but what are the negatives I have for it? 
Well, there have been a few times where the networking has gotten a bit bad. Rubber banding becomes very prominent and makes the game kind of unplayable. But these were rare spells, and I think the devs have done a good job on trying to clamp down on that stability with a few patches. I could also say that the terrain on planets can be extremely unforgiving if you're a new player. There down the line you'll get a grappling hood to more easily traverse terrain, so get one when you can. It's also a bit strange to often find towns without players. Like, you ever go to a mall during Xmas and the mall's open, but all the shops are closed? It's, it's kind of like that. It's a weird feeling, but you can still shop around and occasionally see another player passing by. But, I should say that the player base is a bit thin. It's a really friendly community and full of good folks, but dang, there aren't many people on here. The developers have been quiet about what there is for future content, too, and looking at the game website, there's still a few promised features that they haven't quite delivered yet. Ultimately, despite these flaws, Boundless is a great game. Big ol' thumbs up. Almost a double thumb up for me, but it feels like they can do a bit more to push it over the edge. I've sunk over a hundred hours into this game already, and I really enjoy it. I see myself playing this game for quite a while as I build up my factory that I have for a game. Of course, it is a multiplayer sandbox game, similar to EVE Online, but without the brutality of PvP. And that's a button I've been wanting to be hit for quite a while. The fact that everything is built and controlled by players is amazing and an awesome feature. I highly recommend it, even if the game is a bit scarce with players sometimes. But I think that will conclude this review. Thank you all for watching. This was a long one. I really wanted to go in-depth on this game features, especially since it's an MMO and there's a lot to cover, and mainly just showcase what Boundless has to offer. It's really an undersung game, and a lot of reviewers I've read don't do it justice. What do you think of Boundless? Think it's just a Minecraft clone, or a great platform to start off with? Maybe leave a comment below. As per the usual, if you like this video, feel free to like, and if you want more, feel free to subscribe. Got my Twitch and Twitter in the link description below if you want to stay up to date on when the next video is out. But until next time, this is Mr. Bubbles or Mr. B signing off. Bye bye.